became more and more popular and the frequency was increasing everywhere and here which was no city whatsoever. Uh, it's like a god or somebody was in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and all the cities on the left in Europe or the IBS <laughs> on the right. So anyhow, the bottom line, that was also the time in which we started to appreciate that celiac disease was due to the combination of genes that you're born with and the exposure to grains containing gluten. And both elements are existing in, in the United States and yet no celiac. So. Um, I reasoned that there were all two possibilities, either that celiac was a highly underestimated uh, or there was a third factor that prevented these other two to interplay and, and develop uh, celiac disease. So either way it was quite a win-win situation, so to speak. So even if the original intention was to shift uh, f uh, far from celiac disease, I was thrown in, into it back right away. So it just worked out, yep. kind of worked out. For you that way, I guess so. What um, there's been a lot in the in the medical literature. Some of the papers that you've actually published through your center on the differences between gluten sensitivity and celiac disease. Can you give our listeners or uh, kind of an elaboration of what we know scientifically? What are the differences? Sure. I mean, uh, you know, the um, for, for now long time we've been aware of the existence of a reaction to gluten. Uh, called celiac disease. Uh, what we learn over the years is been, uh, you know, more and more what celiac disease is all about. We start with the concept there was a a pediatric condition involving only kids uh, with only GI symptoms like diarrhea, weight loss, failure to thrive, and so on and so forth. And we learn, you know, over the years that actually this was just the, the tip of the iceberg of the problem. Uh, now what we know. That this is not a pediatric condition anymore, but can affect any age. We know that even if the damage is in the intestine, you can develop any kind of, of symptoms or sign that can touch any organ of our body. We know that uh, there is no sex spared, there is no race spared, so it's not true that it's only Caucasians as we tend to believe. And most importantly, it's not a foodology as we believe at the beginning, but it's truly an autoimmune disease. So again, a recipe with two ingredients, genes that you're born with, and environment. Um, when we put the flag on the ground uh, of the existence of the disease in the United States in 2003, the level of awareness was very low. Um, again, the disease was not diagnosed, was not taught in medical schools, and so on and so forth. From there on, We've seen an interesting phenomenon. Not only there is an increase of awareness, at least in the public, maybe that you know we in the healthcare community have been slow paced to really to catch up with the story. But now we see that the pendulum is going all the way the other way. So we start to see a huge number of people that you know go gluten free and not justifiable by the number of people diagnosed with severe disease. So the question was, who are these people? What else is going on? And for whom, like us, we, we do, does you know, clinical care for people with severe disease? Uh, we're seeing a, 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 or, you know, an exponential increase of people coming to the clinic, claiming that they have problem when they eat gluten and therefore they come to rule out celiac disease. We do the test, they test negative and say, listen, you don't have anything, go in peace, eat gluten, no can, problem. Can I ask you, when you say we did the test, was it serology or biopsy? Or? Well, the, 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 the test for screening C disease is a blood test. So we did the, the cl classical blood test that we do now, the anti-tissue transcodaminase, sometimes the anti antibodies and so on. And when you test negative with that, uh, and eventually if you, you know, screen also for weed allergy with uh, the specific tests for allergies to eat, and you also test negatives for that. We, in general, used to say, look, you, you are gluten, you are okay, there is no problem, go in peace, you, your symptoms are due to something else, and so on and so forth. And these people eventually will leave, uh, will keep searching for what's wrong with them, not find anything wrong, and they decide, given the fact that they observed that you know, decreasing gluten in their diet will make them a little bit better. They decide to go gluten-free, 
all the things that will, they go away. They came back to us and said, look, uh, I may not be celiac, but, you know, look at this. I mean, no, I don't have problems. And what was the occasional observation became a phenomenon. Um, and, and, and therefore, we start to think, well, this can't be just in the mind of these people. There must be something else here. And that prompted us to really look a little bit more in, in that, you know, what was this all about? And that's how we end up to identify this other form of reaction to gluten uh, that is gluten sensitivity. So right now, um, you know, our understanding of the situation is that there is a huge number of people eating gluten-free nowadays. You know, by the end of this day, 60 million people have consumed a gluten-free product. And of course, this cannot be all celiacs because you know even if we diagnose all of them, um, we're talking about three million people. Right. There are 70 million people we see the disease worldwide. It's like that everybody we see the disease moved in the United States and is in gluten free, and that's not the case. We know that's not the case. So, if you dissect who are these people, the first big division is the group that are gluten free because of medical necessity and the ones that are occasional consumers. These are the people that feel better going gluten-free or it's fashionable to go gluten-free or are more, you know, close to, you know, that kind of a naturalistic approach of life. So today they are vegan, tomorrow they are gluten-free, and the day after they will go, you know, salvage life, whatever. Um, for the ones that are on the medical necessity, there are three subgroups. The people that eat gluten and, and have a reaction to it on an allergic basis, so with allergy, we know that roughly we're talking about five, six hundred thousand people in the United States. So an allergic reaction to gluten. And then there is a, an autoimmune reaction to gluten that severe disease, again, affected roughly one percent of the population. Now when you when you say an allergic reaction, are you referring to IgE? IgE mediated okay. reaction, that's right. It's like you know, having allergy to peanuts or strawberry, the same kind of mechanism. The celiac disease is an, you know, it's an autoimmune reaction, as mm -hmm. we know well now, and, uh, and you know, there's a general agreement about that, and in fact, again, 1% of the population, roughly 3 million people. And then there is this third element that is indeed gluten sensitivity, that based on the studies that you were mentioning, now we realize that it's also an immune reaction to gluten, not on an allergic base, like with allergy, not an autoimmune base, like see the disease, still there is an, an, an immune reaction that causes symptoms that are, they can overlap with see the disease. So the difference between see the disease and gluten sensitivity cannot be made on a clinical